Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk, and I am your host. Can we afford single-payer health care for all? That was the question which we asked last week, and which we continue to address in the second of a two-part series. In April of this year in Corvallis, there was a health care conference, and Dr. Marsha Angel and Dr. Arnold Wellman were both keynote speakers. Last week, we heard Dr. Marsha Angel. This week, we will hear her husband, Dr. Arnold Wellman, who is the past editor-in-chief of the New York Journal of Medicine. I, I am old enough to have been practicing medicine at a time when there was no private insurance industry. When I started out in, in, in practicing medicine, that was immediately at the end of World War II. There were very few insurance companies that provided medical insurance anyway. It was, it was not a, a, a profitable or significant business. And those few um, medical insurance companies that existed were mutual companies. And the Blue Crosses and the Blue Shields were not for profit. And it wasn't until healthcare became monetarized that was the term that the late, uh, very distinguished health economist at Columbia University, Eli Ginsberg, used uh, to describe what happened to health care when Medicare and Medicaid were passed in 1965. Then huge amounts of new money flowed into the system. And more important than that, with, Medicaid, with, with the existence of Medicare and Medicaid, an insurance company that wanted to take the risk of, of, of insuring health care could be reassured that there would be very few people who would come, who would need health care and uh, would come to the hospital and wouldn't be able to pay. So that uh, th there, was, there was money to pay for health care and uh, it, was, it, it was all right to insure a system that was going to be supported by Medicare and Medicaid. And uh, that's when, that's when um, health insurance became a profitable industry. That's after Medicare and Medicaid. That's when Blue Cross and Blue Shield associations began to change from a not-for-profit mutual uh, uh, organization to an investor-owned organization. And that's when you began to have the development of huge for-profit corporations, which ended up with United Healthcare and WellPoint and um, and um, um, what's the group in Hartford? Uh, United Healthcare. No, in Hartford. Oh, Aetna. Aetna. Uh, and companies like that began to take over. So I, I think that we, we need to get rid of private insurance, and I agree with her. That's a major part of the problem. However, where we disagree, and we disagree under the most cordial and friendly, <laughs> right, we, we, we have, we have uh, uh, delightful discussions at the breakfast table uh, on this issue. I think that despite its deficiencies, despite the fact that, uh, that the Accountable Care Act strengthens the role of private insurers, and has no adequate cost control. Um, despite that fact, it's better than doing nothing because it does expand insurance coverage. It moves towards universal coverage. It's still, although if, if it were fully implemented, it would add maybe 30 or 32 million more people uh, to, uh, to, uh, to have insurance coverage half of whom would be through expanded Medicaid programs that would be subsidized by the government, and half of whom would uh, be through private insurance exchanges, which the government would, which would also help subsidize in the private sector. They would still leave uh, another 25 or maybe even 30 million people who are uninsured. So although the Accountable Care, the Affordable Care Act does not achieve universal coverage. It's a step in that direction. And it says something about what the country wants to do. 
It says that we recognize health care as a major problem. We're trying to solve it. We're trying to get as much coverage as we can. We're trying to reduce the abuses of private insurance. Um, Marcia didn't have time to mention, but she agrees with me that there are, among the 2,700 pages of of, uh, of, um, uh, 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 of the Affordable Care Act, there are provisions for trials of uh, new ways of paying for health care which would encourage uh, more efficient uh, and less expensive um, uh, health coverage, uh, but no guarantee that they'll work. So I, I tend to say the glass is half full she says it's half empty. And uh, to really understand the difference between us, you have to see her car. She has one bumper sticker on her car, which she's had for many years. She, she's not a bumper sticker type person, but she has one bumper sticker. And that bumper sticker says, I doubt it. <laughs> If, if I still had a car and I had a bumper sticker, it would say, I'm hoping for the best. <laughs> so. Now, I'm convinced that the impending national cost crisis and the bankruptcy of our health care system will not be averted unless there is a much more drastic and systematic approach to health care reform. Marsha and I are on the same page there. We will have to replace all our insurance systems, public and private, I think, with a single public plan that guarantees universal access to prepaid comprehensive care. And this plan will have to be funded by a progressive health care tax, an earmarked health care tax that all citizens, including government officials, and legislators must pay according to their means. Now, prepaid comprehensive care funded in this way would give government firm control over its total health expenditures. It would, the, by deciding how much the tax would be, the government would be able to decide how much it wants to spend on health care. But it would leave, but I believe that it should leave decisions on the specific use of the available resources that government wants to apply to health care where, where it should be, in the hands of physicians and their patients. By setting the rate of the health care tax, government would in effect be capping its costs. Any medical services provided outside such a system would have to be at the patient's expense. And it would be, again, a national decision as to how, how comprehensive uh, the range of services should be. Now, to provide this kind of prepaid comprehensive care, we will need a reorganized medical care system based on private, nonprofit, multi-specialty group practices to which in which physicians are paid largely or entirely by salary. Because, you see, if fee-for-service payment, which is the basis for the present insurance system, fee-for-service system, is to be largely or entirely replaced by a prepaid, capitated payment, which most, uh, I must say that, uh, I want to make it clear, most thoughtful, well-informed experts on health care economics are coming around to that point of view. Most people, the, the smartest health economists in the country now, a, a nonpartisan view, a technical view of the system, agree that fee-for-service payment, which is tied to insurance, insurance is a way of transferring fees from a payer to the provider, and taking 20% or 25% for yourself in the, in the course of that. If fee-for-service is going to be replaced by a prepaid system, uh, a capitated system, then you must have medical care organizations that can take 
that capitated payment. They're taking care of 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, or whatever number of patients at a per capita basis. Take that total, that total amount of money, accept the responsibility for providing comprehensive care, a defined range of benefits, and be accountable for what they provide. But then they have to, they, it has to be a, a, an organization that is capable of satisfy, uh, satisfying the, the expectations of physicians that they're going to be paid fairly for their efforts. And that has to be done collectively uh, the way it's done at the Mayo Clinic or Geisinger or Kaiser, where they take the total money that they get and they pay their doctors salaries which their physician management has decided is reasonable, and all the doctors work together as a team. They don't compete with one another to take patients away or get their share of the dollar. They're paid a good salary, a very competitive good salary, with excellent fringe benefits, uh, and they're expected to work together as a team with nurses, and nurse practitioners, social workers, and other health care uh, professionals to provide the best possible care they can for their patients with the money that they have. That's what we need. And in order to do that, you have to have an, a, a new kind of, a new organization, a, a, a multi-specialty group practice. Uh, the kind of multi-specialty uh, group practice that I've described in, in, in in some detail elsewhere, the publications that I've written and the book that I've written um, would be ideal for this function. Um, you could describe it as small versions of the Mayo Clinic or Kaiser, community-based, appropriately sized for the communities that they serve all over the country. Now there's much reason and considerable empirical evidence to suggest that group practices can deliver care more efficiently than unorganized physicians in solo or small single specialty partnership practices who compete for income and depend on fee-for-service payment, as is the system now. Multi-specialty groups usually include adequate numbers of primary care physicians who integrate and moderate the procedure-based behavior of the specialists. Again, there's almost universal agreement among people who understand health care that a good, efficient health care system that provides good quality service to patients and enables the medical care system to work as efficiently as possible has to be centered around primary care. Primary care has to be the organizing principle and the primary care people, whether they're nurse practitioners or or physicians in primary care have to work as a team with the specialists and there can be no competition. Uh, it, it's it's, it's a, a group arrangement. Uh, most experts agree that substantial savings as well as improved care can be anticipated when primary care physicians collaborate with specialists in well-organized groups. Without the fee-for-service incentive, prepaid salary groups of this kind are less driven to unnecessary or duplicative services, and if the system is funded entirely by government without involving bills, the costs of insurance overhead are avoided. All that 15 to 25 percent that the private insurers take off for simply being middlemen is avoided, and also something that's not sufficiently understood the enormous amount of fraudulent billing and crime uh, 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 involving fraudulent billing, which experts tell me, who, people in the private and in public office have told me that fraudulent billing takes a minimum of 5% of the total amount of money we spend on health care. Some experts say it's 10%. If there are no bills, there can't be any fraud. So, so this is the potential savings would be enormous. And without the incentives that fee-for-service provide for providing overly, having lab tests and CAT scans on dead ducks all the time, uh, 
without that enormous incentive for, for, over, uh, for over-diagnosis and unnecessary uh, procedures, uh, you can save an enormous amount of money. People, again, experts have been studying this. People at the Dartmouth Institute and elsewhere around the country have been looking at this. A conservative estimate is that one-third you know, this is in addition to the money that we would save by getting rid of private insurance. That's 15 to 25 percent of everything that we spend on private insurance, estimated to be, as Marcia said, somewhere around $200 billion. In addition to that savings, it, experts who look at the system say that we could save at least a third, at least a third of what we now spend on health care by avoiding unnecessary, duplicated, uh, in, uh, ineffective um, uh, diagnost diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. The amount of money that we would save would be more than enough, as Marsha has pointed out, to provide coverage for everybody and to provide comprehensive medical care for almost all medical needs. There might be some very special things of uh, elective cosmetic surgery and fancy things that people would want that wouldn't be covered by the system and people would have to pay out of pocket if they want it. But you, you, could, you could save so much money that you could provide good care for everybody. Furthermore, there'd be more than enough, if there are any students or house officers in the, in the audience, be more than enough to cover the costs of medical education and medical research. It would be a drop in the bucket. This coming year, we're going to spend almost $3 trillion on health care. If we could save 30% of that as a minimum, there'd be more than enough to take care of the costs of medical education for everybody. It could be free. People wouldn't have to graduate from medical school with huge debts and be forced to uh, uh, go into specialties that make a lot of money because they're so much in debt. Now, the question is, how do we get there? I mean, how, about, how, how are we going to move to the system that, that I'm describing? Uh, the answer to that question is slowly, <laughs> with great difficulty, in, in, in incremental ways. But there, there, are, there are movements underway. Uh, in some states, for example, uh, there is, there is a, a concern that the organization of health care, the delivery of health care through uh, groups and prepaid arrangements for comprehensive care can be started, as in here in Oregon with, the, with the, your governor's plan to start with Medicaid patients. And in Vermont, uh, they've passed a law which says we'll start by setting up a single payer system, getting rid of private insurance, and then we hope with waivers and persuading the doctors to get the doctors to form the organizations that will deal with the single payer system. But physicians are ultimately going to have to be part of the solution in the sense that they're going to have to agree voluntarily that it's better to practice medicine in groups than privately and individually. Are they doing that? Yes, they are. The evidence is that at the present time, more and more young physicians are choosing to be employed by multi-specialty groups. Uh, that's a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, the number of doctors uh, practicing physicians in this country now being employed by multi-specialty groups uh, is somewhere around 200,000. That would be maybe 25 percent of all practicing physicians and that number is increasing at the rate of about 10 percent a year. Now the problem with that hopeful sign is that first of all most of these uh, most of these groups have to function in a system which still pays on a fee-for-service basis. We don't have a single-payer system. We have a whole lot of private insurers and we have Medicare and uh, so, so they're paid on a fee-for-service basis and uh, physicians are being paid 
mostly. They may get a ba base salary in most of these groups, but they're mainly being paid on the basis of what they bill and collect, with a few exceptions. Kaiser, Mayo, Geisinger, Scott White, Marshfield, uh, and other, uh, other groups, uh, increasing numbers, say, no, we'll collect what we can on a fee-for-service basis, or some of them have their own insurance system, and, and, and we're getting a, a capitation payment. We're getting a premium from the, from the patients who are in our insurance system. We're going to lump all that money together, and we're going to pay our doctors largely, if not entirely, by salary. But it's a slow process. Most doctors, uh, most doctors still feel more comfortable eating what they kill. Uh, and so that if they're really hungry, they can kill some more. Uh, but an increasing number of physicians who are living in the, in the salaried uh, systems are finding that's a good way to live too. You get well paid and your lifestyle is much better. You, have, you have to, don't have to worry about the cost of setting up an office malpractice is paid for, good retirement benefits, good educational benefits, and it's a good style of collegial style of practice. Um, furthermore, an important fact, Marsha has told you some things to remember. Remember this, in the next, by, the, by the end of the next decade, half of all the doctors you're likely to uh, 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 encounter will be women. When I started out in medicine, I, I was in a class of 120, there were three women. And Marcia also lived through an era when women had to struggle to uh, establish their legitimacy as members of the medical profession. Now, fully 50% of applicants of, uh, of, ent of entries into medical school are women. And um, women like uh, to be part of a medical organization. They like to be able to share their professional responsibilities and their professional time because obviously they are interested in, in family obligations as well. And uh, they, they, uh, in general, women find the, 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 the collegial style of practice in groups uh, very comfortable. So that's going to make a big difference. However, there are two there are two problems looming on the horizon. The insurance companies are not going to go away that easily. They see, they see this change coming. They understand that group practices may become a very important part of the healthcare system. They want to own the group practices. So now you have the WellPoints uh, and the United Healthcare and uh, um, again, what, what, what's the name? Aetna. Aetna. They're out there shopping around and buying up practices and forming their own groups. They want the doctors to work for them so they can control the market. A very, very bad development. And the second thing is that hospitals, which are also, unfortunately, in today's commercialized healthcare system, behaving like businesses, competitive businesses, hospitals feeling threatened by the coming change want to be able to control the doctors. And the hospitals, like the insurance companies, are buying up practices. And that's also, in my opinion, a bad idea. So we have to hope that the medical profession will be wise enough in the long run to understand that they have to manage their own affairs under, obviously under federal regulations that will make sure that they're not for profit and that they operate in the way they're supposed to operate, but that they manage their own affairs and don't sell their professional independence to, um, uh, to um, insurance companies or to hospitals. It's slowly happening. The question is, is it going to happen rapidly enough to prevent the system that Marcia has described from imploding? I don't know. I think it's a race. Um, I think it's quite possible that despite the fact that more and more doctors are 
seeing the benefits of organized practice, despite the fact that some, some states are seeing the benefits of maybe setting up single-payer systems. Despite that, I think it's quite possible that the healthcare system that we have now will gradually deteriorate to the point at which uh, we will have to recognize that something has to be done. Uh, Winston Churchill is repu famously reputed to have said about Americans when challenged by his colleagues during World War I on the failure of uh, the Americans to come in on the side of the Allies. Winston, why are your American friends dragging their feet? Why don't they come in and help us defeat the Axis? Churchill was reputed to say, don't worry, they will. Americans always in the long run will do the right thing. But he said, only after they've tried everything else. <laughs> and I think that it's quite possible that we will try everything else, that we'll try to hang on to this system. We, the we being the people who are making all the money from this enormous commercialized system and don't want the system to change. They will hang on, trying to keep it alive, but sooner or later, it has to change. Those people who say to us, to those, uh, to, the, to the doctors and uh, uh, to lay people who advocate for single-payer reform, who say it's pie in the sky. You know, it, it may be a beautiful idea, but it's a dream. It's totally politically impossible. It's off the table. Forget it. No, it won't go away. It won't go away because it's the only system that can work. And I say to people who challenge Marsha and me and people like us being unrealistic and impossible, I say, okay, you suggest a better system. You suggest a system that covers everybody, covers everybody as they should be covered with decent care at a price that we can afford and that is, is economically sustainable. Give me, give me a plan. There's no plan that will work that doesn't have a single payer, a single public payer, an organized, not-for-profit health care delivery of the sort that I'm talking about. It, it, the, there are many ways to get it. It'll happen slowly. We've been listening to a presentation by Dr. Arnold Wellman, past editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, addressing the question, can we afford a single payer health care for all? If you found this program uh, interesting and informative, I hope that you'll join us again next week. Thank you. Bye.